Welcome back to the channel. Reduce AMI just came out today in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is about beta blockers for people with a normal 50% or more ejection fraction after acute myocardial infarction. It's the first study, really the first large well done study in the modern era, and it shows conclusively that beta blockers don't help post-MI. This is a damning study. I wanna to talk to you about reduce AMI. Is it a medical reversal, kind of? Is it the expiration date of medical practices needs to be considered more, kind of? We're gonna get into the weeds on this. So this is reduce AMI. It is a registry-based randomized control trial. See, that's what countries that are smart do. They do registry-based randomized trials. They don't rely on confounded observational studies. They don't always run very expensive randomized control trials. They build into the routine infrastructure and care the easy ability to randomize people. In this case, to two different beta blockers, metoprolol and bisoprolol, or to not being on a beta blocker after acute MI. You have to have a preserved ejection fraction, 50% or more. The authors talk about how they thought about including 40% or more, 40 to 50%, but some people were scared to randomize those patients. Those people who were scared are idiots. They should have included 40 to 50 as well. We would have gotten a lot more interesting information. The event rate would have been higher. We would have been able to see interactions by ejection fraction. So whoever opposed 40 to 50, just a classic case of cardiologists who think they know better than empirical evidence. Those people are idiots. They were wrong. They should have included those patients as well. But they did do a good job. 5,000 people randomized to beta blocker or no beta blocker after myocardial infarction, and almost all of them came from Sweden. There's Estonia and New Zealand who are also accruing. They did a lousy job because they accrued less than 5% of people. It really should have just been a single country study. If you're going to have three countries accrue, they should accrue at sort of a reasonable rates like we saw with um, Nordic, the colon cancer screening study. They randomized patients post-MI between one and seven days to you know, medium target doses, 100 milligrams of metoprolol or bisoprolol, and uh, that should be achieved over the next few weeks. They don't tell investigators exactly how to achieve that dose. To me, that's all good design. I mean, this is a very pragmatic study design. It's how people would be up titrating these drugs in real life. The primary endpoint, of course, is death from any cause or recurrent MI, whichever comes first, just absolutely null, a total wash. Uh, there's also a host of secondary endpoints that are null. To me, the most interesting one was that it didn't even prevent hospitalization from atrial fibrillation. So you would think that having a beta blocker on board would prevent hospitalization from AFib. It didn't. The other interesting thing to me was in the supplement, dyspnea is actually worse if you got a beta blocker than no beta blocker. And one more thing jumped out at me. This is just my reading of the study that jumped out at me right away is that they took some people who were already on a beta blocker at baseline and they randomized them to beta blocker, no beta blocker. Um, if you were assigned the no beta blocker arm and you were on beta blocker at baseline, uh, they actually aggressively down titrated you and pulled you off the beta blocker. I might not have designed it that way. I might have said that, you know, if you're on a beta blocker for whatever reason coming into this study, um, we're going to just have you continue doing whatever you were doing on the, before the study. And in the group that gets beta blocker added, we might add you on a beta blocker. Um, but this is an interesting way to sort of tease out the hypothesis of beta blockade post MI. I might have done a more, even more pragmatic approach. But what really caught me was if you look at the subgroups, the people who were on the beta blocker at baseline who had it titrated off, they actually appear to do even better from having that beta blocker titrated off. I mean, it looks like there's no, there's no interaction coefficients reported, but to me that looks like a very provocative interaction going on there in the, in the subgroup analysis in the supplement. So to me, it's interesting. Probably you do want to peel off the beta blocker in that population. Overall, I think this is a pretty definitive study. Oh, I heard one more objection. The editorialist says the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. That's another thing that's a stupid thing to say because in medicine, you have the burden of proof to show that your intervention improves outcomes. And you can always keep crying that the confidence interval is wide as they're gonna do in this case, but that doesn't obviate the burden of proof to demonstrate under what circumstances does beta blocker post MI improve outcomes. I would have loved to see 40 to 50% ejection fractions included so we could ask that question. But here I would say, yes, the confidence interval is wide because the event rate is lower than anticipated, in part because you were a bit of a coward and didn't enroll the people with lower ejection fraction who would have had a higher event rate. Come on, it's kind of on you, by the way. But it looks totally stone cold null for all of these endpoints. For you to claim that if we were to do it again and bigger, we'd get up to a 20% reduction as the editorialist claims, that to me 
It just feels dishonest. When trials are negative, they're negative, and you have to really prove otherwise if you want to continue to do this. All of that old data that supports beta blockers post-MI, that was done in a barbaric era without many classes of medications and without routine reperfusion. That's entirely irrelevant for the current world. Now, let me talk about some of the more interesting and broader sort of philosophical points here. One, all medical practices need reevaluation when the landscape of medical practices changes. That's particularly true with things like aspirin for healthy people, where the early studies in the 70s and 80s showed that aspirin was cardioprotective and had maybe even mortality benefit, but the more recent studies like Capri show absolutely not. Aspirin does not have that benefit, and the USPSTF and others have rescinded that baby aspirin recommendation. I think it's true for uh, acute MI, a disease that's underwent rapid change, that we need new trials of a lot of these medications. I think... It is also true for things like COVID-19. Every single COVID-19 randomized control trial is obsolete, in my opinion, in 2024. Remdesivir and, and dexamethasone and even giving Paxlovid, that was for an older strain of the virus in a world without high levels of population immunity. All those studies need to be repeated or those drugs need to go bye-bye. You know, to rely on old evidence when the entire landscape has changed is a fool's errand. The same is true in oncology. We have many, many practices that were done in a world with poor quality therapy transplantation of multiple myeloma in CR1. That is clearly overturned with determination in this ELGB study, and it was upheld in the early studies in the 1990s. What's my point? When there's dramatic changes in medical practice in any field of medicine, you need to repeat the randomized studies that upheld the basic principles in the beginning, because things may have changed. Second point, beta blockers post-MI was a quality metric. In other words, they would judge hospitals and doctors by the rate with which they would prescribe these drugs. But of course, these drugs don't do anything. Quality metrics are almost always stupid. Somebody, Aaron Goodman, I think, said on Twitter that uh, most quality metrics are bad. I disagreed with him, which I rarely do, because I can't think of a single good quality metric. This is an example. You get some administrator or some bureaucrat or somebody who works at Harvard Health Policy who sees patients maybe once a year, and this person decides to work with CMS to set beta blockers post MI. It's a quality metric because the evidence is so strong that it works. Of course, they don't know many things. One, the evidence is not so strong that it works. Two, it turned out not, it's not a good quality metric. And three, you're penalizing people from practicing medicine. You're creating all this administrative overhead, and there's just no evidence that that quality metric directly improves patient care. I can't think of a single good quality metric. Rates of mammography, that's a terrible quality metric. It ignores the fact that it's a preference-sensitive decision. Rates of colonoscopy, again, terrible quality metric. Again, preference-sensitive decision. Uh, beta blocker prescriptions, pretty much all of the quality metrics around uh, if you present with heart failure, do they put you on goal-directed therapy where they put you on doses of things like Entresto that are much lower than the doses ever studied. So we have no evidence that putting somebody with a new heart failure on some his poor homeopathic dose of interest to improve outcomes. The Paradigm HF trial, the only positive trial, tested a whopping dose, 200 milligram equivalents of LZZ696, which is probably that uh, 97103 Entresto dose. And anything less than that dose has never been formally studied. These metrics are piss poor. You need to take metrics and then do a randomized trial of implementing the metric and show that implementing the metric actually improves outcomes beyond what doctors are already doing. That's the burden. And that's something that we wrote about, John Ioannidis and I, in a JAMA internal medicine paper maybe about 10 years ago called Evaluating Health Systems Processes in Randomized Control Trials. So this is yet another failure of the bloated administrative state in medicine, making this sort of a quality metric when it doesn't even work. I think, you know, the conference interval is wide. And it's the same thing they said about the Cochrane Mask Review. We did a study where we took every wide conference interval in all of Cochrane in the last few months, and we asked, what is the conclusion that people say about that wide conference interval when the point estimate is null? And the answer is, this don't work, this don't work, this don't work. But for two things, beta blockers post MI, masking, people want to say, well, the conference interval is wide. People selectively say the conference interval is wide, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, for things that they like or that they've been doing, and they have egg on their face for having done. That's when they say it. They don't say it for novel drug coming to the U.S. market that failed and nobody has any sort of um, uh, buy-in to, nobody has any sort of uh, ego tied to it. In my mind, beta blocker post-MI no longer is relevant in the modern age. Most medical practices 
in a shifting evidence base need reappraisal. That's something that Adam Sifu and I wrote about called Should Medical Practices Come With an Expiration Date? We pioneered that concept. This is in some ways a medical reversal, in other ways not, because it is possible that it truly did work in the 1980s when you weren't reperfusing people and it truly doesn't work now, but somewhere along the way it was perpetuated even though there was strong suspicion that it's no longer doing as much good as it could. The next big point is, next time have some courage, get a little bit of courage and start to randomize 40 to 50. Not doing that is just another classic problem in cardiology, which we saw with the CAST study, where this was tested, of course, flaconide and other class 1C antiarrhythmic agents post-MI. It is well documented that many cardiologists felt it was unethical to randomize to something that they knew was life-saving. Well, whoops, it actually kills people. And here, whoops, if you actually had some courage, we might be able to see if there's interaction by ejection fraction and that it maybe does work when you get down to 40%. And you might actually have a higher event rate. So next time, I think it's okay to randomize people and not to think you know the answer before you've done the study. Overall, great study, registry-based randomized trial, read the whole paper, read the whole supplement. I don't see any problems with this study. I don't see any substantive problems. Somebody's going to say, oh, the dose they didn't go high enough dose. Well, you, you don't know what you're talking about because no one's getting to these high doses. Now, continue to prescribe your homeopathic dose of Entresto and pat yourself on the bath because, by the way, that dose has also not been validated, okay? We're going to do some work on doses soon. That's not really a criticism in my mind. They're, they're pushing for doses that I think are the most commonly prescribed doses. Um, you know, what to do about people who are on beta blocker at baseline. I think I might have made a different design choice there. You could have excluded those people. You could have just had them stay the course. They actively down titrated. That could have been sort of a perverse thing. Uh, here, ironically, it shows that, that they may benefit the most from down titration of the beta blocker post MI, which is a very provocative finding. Raises the question why they're on the beta blocker in the first place. Only a fraction of them had had prior MI. Maybe it was something else like. It actually, it's not explained by AFib. It might be just explained by the fact that some of them are on beta blocker for hypertension, which is a pretty dumb thing to do because beta blockers are the worst drug for high blood pressure. All right, those are my thoughts on this very provocative paper, the Reduce AMI study. I think um, if you're doing a journal club, hopefully this video is of interest to you. If, uh, if uh, you're at the conference right now, hopefully it'll be of interest to you. If you're setting quality metrics in your hospital, not only should you not sell the quality metrics, you should get a piece of paper and write down, I resign because you have no value. That's right. Administrators who set quality metrics have no value. Randomize any quality metric to having it or not having it and show me you improve outcomes in that healthcare system. And if you're not willing to do those studies, then shut up about your quality metrics. I've, and if somebody disagrees and they can think of a good quality metric, antibiotics, four hours after going to the emergency room with um, pneumonia-like symptoms, bad quality metric, uh, um, even the, 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 the door to balloon time, even that quality metric has got some dubious evidence. I mean, obviously, we want to get things going quickly, but do you actually improve outcomes if you force yourself to get there quicker? Uh, uh, you can read Ending Medical Reversal about that. If you can think of a really good quality metric where the metric itself has been shown to save lives, not merely the underlying concept, uh, I'll buy you a beer. Uh, put it in the comments. I'm very curious. I can't think of one. Beta blockers post MI, terrible quality metric. All the money spent on hiring people to keep track of this was completely wasted, and they could have done this study 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and in fact, they should continue to do this study. This study shouldn't just be a a one-time registry-based randomized trial. It should be a continually randomized. Okay, that's my last point. There are some things in medicine where we don't need a series of trials. Every single person presenting in the United States with acute MI should be randomized in a multifactorial way all the time. Everybody should be randomized in a continually enrolling, registry-based, open-ended, randomized trial, multi-arm study, where you can answer many, many questions and ask them again and again in the future if the evidence-based shifts, and to ask a plethora of questions, something like the Stampede study for prostate cancer. That should be the model. Being, not being randomized should be the exception, not the rule. Being randomized should be the rule. And in fact, I think there's some good ethical questions around who needs to consent. I'm not necessarily convinced that individuals post MI need to consent to all these things. There can be even sort of some, some sort of broader consent processes in a district or region, uh, a broader sort of consent uh, to, to being randomized to suitable clinical questions in the event of uh, emergencies when we don't know what's best. That I think is, is something worth pursuing with some, some ethical work. So maybe I'll do some work in that space too. All right, those are my thoughts on this video. Um, 
Great paper, reduce AMI, two thumbs up from me, randomized study, New England Journal. The critics, totally wrong, wrong about dose, wrong about confidence intervals, how to interpret that, I disagree. They only say, they only say that selectively. If, you really, if you're really a stickler, then show me every single conference interval that wide, you say the same thing, absence of evidence, not evidence of evidence. Show me that, go to the drug development pipelines, all the failed drugs, pull out all those drugs, and show me that you want us to test them again. Be consistent. Not a single one of those people is consistent, okay? When the point estimate is as null as this is, it's a negative study. And don't cry to me about event rates when you didn't have the courage to put the people in who would have had higher event rates. All right, until next time.